everyone and welcome back to RJ Sanderson TV for 2021. Dave Kennedy is my name and joined as always by Roy Sanderson to talk tax, to talk about the economy and to talk about this newest lockdown, unfortunately. Roy, Roy how, how are you coping? Oh, Dave, uh, yeah, it's great to be back for 2021. Um, the lockdown that Victoria's put down right now, a bit difficult, a bit uh, difficult for most business clients. There's a few people hurting out there because it was brought on so suddenly. What about uh, the period, we will go back into, into lockdown, but what about the period before lockdown? Were you starting to see uh, some light at the end of the tunnel? I think many businesses were feeling a bit confident. Things had bounced back. Uh, retailers were rubbing their hands together. Um, they were at least making money rather than being closed. And the construction industry was doing well. And I think we were heading in the right trajectory. So this is a bit of a, a kick in the pants for everybody to be another to have another lockdown. Well, let's get into the detail of it uh, with some of our news headlines um, because Victoria in lockdown is unfortunately the story that we have to lead with again today. We, we were planning uh, a week ago to, to talk about uh, probably more um, up and about things or more positive things, optimistic things, but we are talking about Victoria in lockdown again. Um, how, I suppose broadly, um, what do you think the main factor is affecting businesses when um, you know, the, the lockdown was announced? I think it's the uncertainty. When, a lockdown, when the lockdown got announced, businesses had no time to plan. And if you had um, stock sitting there for Valentine's Day that you'd already had delivered sitting in your fridge, um, you had staff organised, and it came so hard and so sudden that I think businesses, and especially restaurants, had been hit harder than any other business. The worst possible weekend would have been Valentine's Day. It's just been awful for those businesses. And I think that's it. And now, here we are right now, not quite sure if we get out of lockdown on a Wednesday so or a Thursday morning. So if the announcement comes today or tomorrow, businesses are going to have nearly 24 hours to order stock, get delivered, organise staff. It's very hard to bounce back with 24 hours notice or less in business. It is hard. The risks are perhaps starting to become more on display or more overt, do you think that businesses need to prepare for lockdowns and, and put that into their operational strategy moving forward? I think they need a contingency plan. The chances are this is not our last lockdown. It could happen again and it could happen at very short notice. So the businesses that have just had this five-day lockdown that may be extended, they need to look at what happened in that five days. And if it happens again next month or in three months or five months, what will they do differently? Because they need to learn from this five-day lockdown. How does a business that is traditionally bricks and mortar and traditionally in person, some, someone such as a restaurant, as you say, you had restaurants that bought stock and that bought, bought food. How do they actually put that into their strategy that potentially... There is another lockdown coming up. If this happens, we're going to do, um, you know, if X happens, we're going to do Y. How, how, do, you, how do they actually do that? Well, if you, if you were referring specifically to restaurants, they have to look at deliveries. If you're talking about retailers, they have to look at click and collect, how to make it better, how to update their website with their stock quicker and easily make it easily accessible to the general public. Because the general public have, have become accustomed to buying online. Yes, it was great we're out of lockdown. We all went back to the big shopping centres. But the reality is we now, we now know how to buy online. Mm. So make that process simpler. And I think it's not one answer fits every business. Mm. I think it's very much you look at the business specifically to work out what they should do. Have you had any hard conversations yourself, Roy, where business owners, you know, have... I suppose we've empathised and we've sympathised with business owners during the first lockdown and during the second lockdown, but have you had to say to some guys, guys, it's time to you know, open our eyes to the fact that there's more lockdowns mo more than likely coming, you need to adapt? Um, we have had conversations with businesses in the tourism industry that have to look at a whole different business model. What they were experienced at is not what's going to make them money for quite some time, depending on what happens with travel, inter interstate and international. Um, other businesses, um, it's not about closing down, it's more about um, di just different strategies, how they do things differently. That's the focus. Mm -hmm. And uh, one campaign that we've seen that is going to do something differently is a brilliant campaign by the Victorian Chamber of Commerce uh, to change the date of Valentine's Day. Uh, 14th, we saw you know, that uh, th those plans were you know, 
put into limbo. You ha you, as you mentioned, you had uh, businesses that had bought plenty of stock and, and plenty of um, you know food that they were going to or the perishables that were they were going to trade uh, over the Valentine's Day weekend. But the Chamber of Commerce encouraging couples to go out and celebrate Valentine's Day on February 28th. It's a brilliant campaign. And, and Roy, what are the economic implications for a campaign like this? Oh, I think it's brilliant. And, and we know that Vecchi, Victorian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, are a friend of this show. We've had them on and interviewed them. Um, brilliant idea. I'm right behind it. I have one reservation, though, and the reservation is if we book it in for the 28th, what happens if we have a lockdown on the 27th and we go through this again? That would be awful, but I fully support having another date because I'm not even sure who picked the 14th. I'm not, why, I'm not sure why we have the 14th, but I'd be very happy if it was the 28th. Well, you said you had one reservation. I thought you might mean you have a reservation at Grossi Florentino already for, the, for February 28th, but um, it is... I think a, a great um, campaign because it will try and you know promote businesses to, to or promote people to to go out there and spend, which is one of those things that we've talked about on this show a lot. Is uh, the idea that for the business, the uh, economic cycle to operate effectively, people need to go out and spend and do the things that they were doing before. And I suppose that takes us to some of the economic indicators that we look at uh, on this show every time, starting with GDP growth. You can see here that. Now, these numbers, of course, are, are not... Uh, they haven't yet factored in any sort of immediate reactions to the Victorian lockdown, but everything was heading in the right direction with GDP for the quarter ending uh, 31st of December 2020. Isn't this interesting? When we were talking about this last year, in 2020, about September, October, we were hoping that we would have the Nike tick to come out of um, the recession. And we've got that Nike tick right there we have bounced out quite quickly, which is great. So that graph couldn't look much better, really, compared to what we were thinking about in October. Unemployment is a similar story. Um, in, in the inverse, I suppose, you can see here that you know, unemployment spiked um, and then there was uh, a, a vast improvement. Um, again, sort of similar, similar story, but inverse for unemployment versus, uh, versus growth. Well, the forecast was that unemployment was going to struggle for about two years. So the Reserve Bank had made those predictions. So again, we are bouncing back people coming out of JobKeeper a little bit quicker than what they had forecast, and that's good. It's not, it's not all roses yet, by the way, mm. but we are certainly heading in the right direction. Speaking of all roses, I'm going to talk about consumer confidence because that is uh, a, an index that we've followed very carefully. You can see here that consumer confidence was really on the up and, and returning to you know, to, to above average levels, uh, you know, with this graph averaged out over the last 15 years or so. But if you just look closely at the very right-hand side of that graph, there's a little, uh, a little downturn. And that came in, in January, Roy, and, you know, economists have put that down to these snap lockdowns in Perth, Adelaide, and we saw one um, just before Christmas, uh, of course, in the northern Sydney. So sentiment around um, confidence from consumers is very flighty. Um, by nature, and it'll be interesting to see what the effect of this Victorian lockdown is on this graph the next time we're here. It is, and these, these um, emergency lockdowns that we have, which is really based on the number of COVID cases that are announced at various states, um, it'll be interesting to see what happens over the next uh, four to six months while we have got a vaccination hitting the public and how that affects uh, confidence. Because at the moment, we look at that graph and we are looking at something that we haven't had it this confident for about eight, eight or nine years, which is fantastic and surprising. I want to ask you about lockdowns in general and about the response um, of governments to lockdowns and to cases, because I know that that could form the basis of Roy's rage, which is back very shortly. But before we get to that, let's talk about JobKeeper as our second topic today, because the deadline looms large for JobKeeper. We know that um, it's, it's running out and the federal government is in an interesting position at the moment where they are going to have to make a determination around whether this subsidy continues or whether it does not. So, Roy, what, what's your, your general thoughts on JobKeeper at the moment? Um, I don't believe that um, Josh Frydenberg will extend JobKeeper. He, I believe he'll stay true to his word and it will finish at the end of March. It's currently at $1,000 for full-timers and $600 for part-timers. And I see no way that he's going to extend it. But I think what he may do 
is there may be something that is industry specific rather than across all industries. Tourism targeted, maybe restaurant targeted, especially after what's happened in Victoria. I also believe that as, as of um, today, the state government in Victoria have indicated they are looking at potential grants for businesses in Victoria and hopefully something is announced uh, in the near future and that was to be targeted particular industries like restaurants. Now you say Mr. The, you think Mr. Frydenberg is going to introduce something industry or potentially introduce something industry specific. Should it be industry specific or, or do you think it should be state specific from your experience? Uh, it, look that's a very tough question because if it's state driven or state specific it means that Josh Frydenberg is maybe favouring one state over another and then there's going to be a, a bit of fight between the states to get a, um, a go or, or a share of the cash that's up for grabs. Um, and an example there is that Queensland did a lockdown, they locked down their borders for an extended time, way past what other premiers thought was fair. And what that meant is Queensland's tourism industry was hit harder than more than most other so, um, states. And Queensland's premier has put their hand up to say they want something specifically for Queensland's tourism industry, but that that was driven by the fact that the Premier closed the borders for such a long time. Interesting. And, and the, the lockdown, I just want to... We, we talk, we've talked about consumer confidence and the economic cycle and how people need to spend. We've got a great graph here on household consumption, which uh, we'll show you here. You can just see that even though... This is the interesting part. Even though disposable income during the period of... or during the start of the pandemic actually spiked. So you're not reading that incorrectly. People's disposable income went up before it went back down and that's because the government subsidised it. But what is intriguing is that consumption also went down. So you've got this fascinating scenario where people have more money yet are less willing to spend it. So, you know, that, that I suppose, in one graph illustrates what lockdowns do to people. And, and even though there is an appropriate stimulus response, sometimes people aren't willing to part with that money. Inter very interesting graph because I don't know if it's all about willing to part or able to part. At the end of 2020 that that graph showed, we, Victoria especially, was still in lockdown. The rest of the country was out and about and going to restaurants, but Victoria was in lockdown. We had government support with JobKeeper coming into the household, but no shopping centres were open, no restaurants were open to attend, you could get takeaway. So we actually didn't go out and spend money like we would normally go out. Our habits were changing because we were being forced to be at home. So we might have had more income, we had no ability to spend it would be my argument. Interesting. Well, I, what I want to do is ch change uh, pace to back to the, the states um, around JobKeeper and have a look at some of the numbers per state because these are intriguing as well. Uh, Victoria still has the most people, as at uh, 31st December, still had the most people on JobKeeper, 626,000, 490,000 for New South Wales. I mean, it's hard to argue that that's because, or that, you know, that that's not because of, of lockdowns. It's interesting that this graph um, shows that Victoria and New South Wales have dropped quite a bit, but Victoria's still got more people on JobKeeper. This is up till December, so this is the two lots of JobKeeper uh, April to September and then October to December. And this probably mirrors our practice as an accounting practice. I would have said that as at December for that, qu that quarter, about half, and it's 44% is what it shows, we're still on JobKeeper. Mm. And I think what when the next lot of stats are released and we see who's on JobKeeper from January to March, I believe it'll be more than half again have dropped away. So maybe it'll be around about 15 or 20 per cent of those originally on JobKeeper are still on JobKeeper in this last um, last quarter. And just uh, just on that, the percentage drop is the telling stat there. You know, 44 per cent of, of Victorians have uh, have come off JobKeeper, but that's a lot f uh, that's a lot fewer than the number that have come, or the proportion of people that have come off in the other states, ranging between 60 per cent and and 70 per cent. Their WA with the the biggest proportion of people that have moved on from JobKeeper. So interesting stats there around the states and it will be interesting to see what Mr Frydenberg and the federal government as well as the state governments do in terms of providing stimulus for affected businesses and for affected people. Yes, and I think that graph shows that uh, when we're in extended lockdown, like Victoria was, that's the reason uh, less people came off JobKeeper in Victoria because our lockdown was f extended way above all the other states.
Let's move on to interest rates, Roy. And the big question is to fix or not to fix? That is the question, if you like. Um, variable versus fixed rate loans. We're at a period of, uh, of historically low interest rates that we hear uh, you know, that term thrown around in every news environment. Um, what do you think? What, what do you think in terms of whether you should fix your loans at the moment or, or keep them variable? Well, it's interesting. We have been coming, our interest rates have been coming down for some time and it's been a difficult decision. And I've been saying fix for quite a while, not believing they could get as so low as they are now. But what, what's happening right now, and I've got a graph here that I think is really helpful in that this is a live, a fair income, this is a client scenario. No names, no pack drill. But I asked the client what interest rate they were on. And they said uh, between 2 and 3% approximately. And I said, OK, you're probably in the right ballpark on where you should be. But when I asked to see their, their actual uh, interest statements, I could see that the home loan was on 2.78, the investment loan at 3.32. Now, it's with the ANZ Bank. We suggested they go back to the ANZ Bank, fix it for three years at 2.09 and 2.69. If you look at the bottom right corner of that graph, you actually see that the saving in interest over that three years is $22,284. Now, that's an actual example, not about refinancing and not about our, our loans team trying to make money out of a refinance. It's about looking at the client's bank statements, telling them that if they make a phone call to the ANZ, and that's all it takes, and they ask to fix, and these are the rates they'll be offered for three years, that's the saving they're going to have. And I think this is a, a message and a sign to everybody who thinks they're on a good interest rate with whatever bank you are with, you should look at what the bank are offering for fixed rates. The chances are you can fix it right now for three to four years at a lower rate than you're paying on variable, because I don't believe interest rates will go down anymore. What, what, what are the barriers to people doing that? Is it just that they don't want to speak to their bank or are they worried about fees or, or what, what do you think well, some of the barriers there, are? There's no fees as far as fixing your interest rates are concerned. So we're not going to get hit with fees. If the banks, if you don't believe you're getting a good deal with a the bank, then you talk to a broker, whether it's RJS or any finance broker, because they have access to a number of different lenders and they can look at your scenario. A refinance does require more work because you've got to verify your income and that you can afford the loan. To fix an existing rate with your existing lender is a, a simple phone call and, and possibly an application form. Okay, well, and, and obviously, as you mentioned, people can do that through RJ Sanderson if they, if they want to. Yes, RJ, uh, RJS Loan Solutions is, is our sister company and we can help them. If they're not sure how to do it, then send it through. We don't charge to do that sort of work for our clients. Cryptocurrency is another interesting area that uh, is in the news a lot. We're hearing a lot about uh, particular things. GameStop, the GameStop phenomenon, which we're, we're perhaps not going to go into today because it's uh, it is slightly complex in terms of its um, you know in terms of how it's it's come about. But it has been uh, on the news a lot. But one thing we do want to talk about is Bitcoin. It is quite extraordinary the cryptocurrency phenomenon, and particularly its relationship with Elon Musk. The price um, we see. Here, this is a fantastic graph that's been provided by Blockchain Research Lab. You can see there that on the bottom axis, on the bottom axis is minutes. So you can see the exact point in time where Elon Musk simply tweeted the word hashtag Bitcoin, and the sheer price explosion that came off the back of it in the preceding, you know, two, three, four hours. It's 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 quite uh, it's quite a, a um, it's quite a phenomenon, and it also happened with another cryptocurrency, a lesser known one called Dogecoin. You can see there the the um, the graph on the right illustrates price. The graph, oh, sorry, the graph on the left illustrates price. The graph on the right actually illustrates volume. So this was a stock that you know relatively was was relatively quiet. A cryptocurrency, I should say, that was relatively quiet in terms of people trading it, and then boom. Elon Musk just tweeted one word, Doga, and it, it sort of exploded in volume. Um, it's, it's, quite the, it's quite the phenomenon, Roy. It is, and it, doesn't it show the power of Elon Musk uh, when he can just tweet one word and this is what happens? Um, I wouldn't mind him tweeting. Elon, if you're watching, can you tweet RJ Sanderson Associates? I'd be very much appreciative of it. Yeah, just a direct message, maybe five, ten minutes before, <laughs> and, uh, yeah... It, it, Elon, if you're watching as well, just tweet me as, as well personally. Dave Kennedy, I don't even know what my Twitter handle is. But um, 
One thing that you don't hear too much talked about in the in the news around Bitcoin is, you know, people we hear about the, the major success stories or the major flops, but what are the actual tax implications on cryptocurrencies? Because there is there's questions around um, how is it taxed, jurisdiction, is it taxed, I suppose, is, is the first thing, and and, uh, and what are the regulations around it? So maybe a general overview, Roy, on, on the taxation um, implications for trading Bitcoin. So we've mentioned Bitcoin and and Dogecoin, Dogecoin. Yep. but there's over 4,000 there's over 4,000 cryptocurrencies out there. There's some as low as seven cents, which I think you've got more chance of of uh, making money on than what you have if you buy something worth fifty-seven thousand dollars. But uh, the question is, do you pay tax if you make a profit? And the answer is, if you live in Australia, you are taxed in Australia on your worldwide income. So the answer is yes, you're going to pay tax on profits. And I've got a slide here that will show you if you are an investor in something. Now, you see at the top, it says Bitcoin. And it says that if you, um, as an investor, if you hold this stock for more than 12 months and you sold it for 120000 you purchased it for 80000 your gain is 40000 Assuming you owned it for more than 12 months, then you only pay tax on half the gain. So about a $6,800 tax bill in that scenario. But you could replace the word Bitcoin with BHP shares or NAB shares or any sort of investment that you make that's over 12 months. That's for an investor who owns it for more than 12 months. Right. So, it's, so I suppose the point there is that Bitcoin is taxed um, you know, it's on, on the capital gains, very similar to how other, other shares and, 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 and those are, are taxed. Is that correct? That's correct. And you've got another example here. What, what if someone's trading more frequently? We're seeing retail investors day trade at the moment. What if people are trading more frequently? And people have asked the question about the confidentiality of buying cryptocurrency in Bitcoin and who knows about it. Well, the tax office have access to all sorts of records. So my recommendation is do include it on your tax return. When you are buying and selling, this is the formula that we use. It's a little bit different to when you own it uh, and own it for more than 12 months. We look at your total sales for the year and your total sales uh, purchases for the year. But we get to take into account the value of the stock at the start of the year and the end of the year. Now, what this means as a trader, meaning you're buying and selling, you're running a business of trading Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency, you're going to be taxed on the gain on the market price at 30th of June, even if you haven't sold them. So the price on this example went from 15000 to 30000 That's a gain of 15000 You're going to pay tax on that because it went up in value as at the 30th of June, even though you didn't sell 30,000 worth of stock. So that's the formula that an accountant is going to use. So I suppose there there's a, there's a, there's a message as well in, you know, don't just consider the, the purchase price and the sale price of your investment. You need to actually consider the, the length of time holding it. And that 12 months seems to be the, the, the important, uh, I suppose, um, yardstick in terms of time. Yes. Some people like to buy and sell regularly throughout the year. It's called day trading. Um, it's, some people believe they can make money on it. And a small number do, but it's much higher risk to do it that way. And you, you will be treated as a, a trader rather than a, an investor over time. Roy, you came in here and uh, there was something that was on your mind and you were seething. Um, and I said, don't worry, Roy, save it because we've got time on the show for Roy's rage, which we're going to get into right now. Roy, what is on your mind? Well, it would have easily... People will think this is probably going to be something to do with an immediate lockdown, but that happened very recently. <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to actually have a shot here. My rage is all, at all the premiers of Australia. We know very well that we need um, tourism. We know we don't have money coming in from overseas, which is about $80 billion a year that is not hitting Australia's soil. So Australians have to travel within Australia. But if you're going to close the borders and lock people in a state, then the confidence of somebody booking a holiday to an interstate destination, whether it be Western Australia, Queensland, New South Wales, will be at all-time lows. And people will not book interstate travels and we will miss out on the tourism dollar of Australians spending money in Australia if we continue to have border lockdowns at the drop of a hat. 
So open the border, and if you have a case that is in the northern suburbs of Victoria, then get everybody who's in certain suburbs and say, you're not allowed to leave the home. You do not leave your home unless you are um, an essential worker. Lock it down to suburbs rather than doing a whole state because that's going to affect our tourism dollar around Australia, I think, for a long time. OK. There's a bit to digest there. Uh, and, uh, you know, I know that uh, you came in here off the long run. I'm going to ask you a few questions, though, off the back of it. You mentioned that it's incumbent on the state premiers. What, what responsibility do you think the federal government has in this, if any? Well, I don't think the federal government can determine the state border lockdowns. I think the premiers have that responsibility and authority. Uh, there were some arguments about whether state governments could lock down or whether it was a federal responsibility. I would prefer not to have state border lockdowns. I believe we're one country and we should be working as one country, not as separate countries. And what about in terms of... Uh, we, you've you sp spoken about, um, you know, unrestricted travel. Would you be willing to risk, you know, a, 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 an outbreak um, and the economic implications of that by opening up the borders for tourism? Or do you think that the elimination strategy is still the best strategy for, in terms of its economic impact? If we have tracing that works around Australia, then somebody who is a close contact can be traced down to a particular area, household, suburb. I'm not saying don't have lockdowns at all and it's a free-for-all everywhere. I'm saying reduce the lockdown down to suburbs or regions. Not, like, we have, we have an office in Wangaratta. They've got, they haven't had a case. They have no risk of having a case, mm. but our Wangaratta office can't go to work today and all their businesses are closed for that five days. It's not fair on people like Wangaratta, Geelong, the suburban country Victoria, shouldn't have this lockdown like we should have in particular suburbs within Victoria, within Melbourne. Mm. And you drew, you drew on an interesting point there, of course, contact tracing. That, that's the key, isn't it? You have to have, if you want to pursue this strategy, you have to have good contact tracing. You do, and that's critical. Let's change pace. I'll give you a little bit of time to, to, to calm down because property is a really interesting space that we haven't touched on uh, on RJ Sanderson TV uh, this episode, but we have in, in plenty of others. And uh, we saw that supply was limited, particularly in Victoria, um, during the lockdown periods of 2020. And then boom, suddenly all these houses were on the market and we've seen extraordinary growth across property. And here to talk to us in more detail about it, Today is Leah Kalman, the president of the Real Estate Institute of Victoria. Great to have you on the show, Leah. Welcome to RJ Sanderson TV. Thank you for having me. Leah, Victoria hit with lockdowns, uh, you know, throughout last year. But uh, during the spring, I understand that the Victorian property market experienced some huge growth. Tell us a, a little bit about uh, where the Victorian market is at the moment uh, in the property space. Yeah, absolutely. It, it was a really challenging time for, you know, not only, um, you know, buyers and sellers, but, you know, all aspects of, of property across, across Victoria. Um, we saw that the spring, the traditional spring season was delayed. So it really didn't start until about the middle of October and it uh, continued all the way through, through December. You know, we were seeing auctions right up until Christmas Eve and agents came back on, on about the 4th of January this year. So there's a lot of activity and we've seen tremendous price um, growth, which is fantastic. Leah, have we got a graph on the, uh, the growth rates for houses and apartments that we can share with our audience? Yeah, it's very impressive. It's certainly, um, you know, I suppose gives me reassurance because throughout you know, if I go back as far as March, you know, when I was speaking to agents, multiple agents every day, um, there was no sign of any price adjustments. We knew that volume levels were going to get um, harder and harder, and particularly when we went into stage four lockdown in, in Vic. Um, you know, but it was funny that all those experts early, early in the year were you know, screaming out that there was going to be a 30 or a 40% price crash. And it just didn't happen. And all it did was scare everyone. And it didn't need to happen, to be honest. Leah, we've just seen a couple of those uh, graphs, but, you know, the quarterly change, it seems quite logical. But you must be very impressed with the annual change that you've still seen annual price growth despite those, as you said, those really bleak economic um, forecasts. Um, is that the most impressive uh, part of these results, do you think? Yeah, they are. I, I think it's, you know, to see 
I think it was sitting at 9.5% as, as a medium um, price increase for the um, for the December quarter figures, and, and that was the biggest growth we've had since 2000. Uh, you know, so you know, considering all of the growth that Victoria's had over a period of time, it shows the resilience of of the property market. But I think it also shows and gives reassurance for vendors who were wanting to sell and buyers that wanting to buy that, you know, by investing in Mel in, in Melbourne, regional Victoria, wherever you chose, it was a sound investment. Leo, as an accountant, I had many businesses, uh, uh, clients, talk about property in September, October when predictions of crashes were common and a number of clients were saying, we're going to wait until JobKeeper finishes in early 2021 because the market will be a mess and we're going to buy then. I suspect that they're um, ruining that decision, but I'm curious on what you put the price rising down to. Is it more demand or is it lack of supply? Um, it, look, there's definitely been a lack of supply. We, we've seen that um, throughout the, the last six months of, of 2020. I think there were a large portion of, of people that thought that they were going to get a bargain. And quite often I would joke with media to say, you know, we're not Maya. We're not having a stock take sale. You're not going to be able to jump in and, and get a bargain. You know, there was no evidence to suggest that was ever going to happen. Um, but still stock levels are low uh, and we're still starting to, starting now to see them come through. Um, but prices continue to climb and, and we are anticipating that the March quarter figures um, probably won't be at that same growth rate, but we should still see growth in those March quarter figures. And what about the growth in country Victoria? The, the figures you showed us were, were regional. What's country doing at the moment? Oh, look, country Victoria is smiling from ear to ear. I think one of the, the key aspects of, of COVID is it's changed the way we, we live and how we think about property. You know, as you can see, I'm at home today. I'm actually at the kitchen table. You know, my, one of my children is to the right of me homeschooling. And we've got this ability to be able to live wherever we want to, but be able to still commute for work. So now regional Victoria, we're seeing these fantastic annual growth figures because now talent is actually going to those regional cities, but they don't need the job. So there is no longer that, you know, that need of, of, of the particular type of employment already secured. They can live there, have a fantastic lifestyle. Affordability is certainly a key factor and still be able to commute into the, the city or wherever their work is. Interesting and, and uh, no doubt bolsters your, your stories when you're lobbying for regional infrastructure with, uh, you know, facilities in regional Victoria now probably more necessary than ever. Um, Leah, just on, on, we've spoken about buyers and we've spoken um, about investors, but what about agents? Uh, what, have you seen any uh, examples of agents that have really adapted uh, during the COVID time and, and how, have, you know, what are some of the positive stories you've seen out of that? Yeah, agents have been really versatile and, and have shown that they can be agile. And, and often I think the industry has been, been a little bit slow to adapt to technology. Uh, we saw when we went into that first lockdown, you know, I think it was Good Friday, um, and we needed to quickly plan to convert auctions to the online platforms. You know, that happened really quickly. So we've seen that actual technology remain in place. So whilst today we're in our five-day snap lockdown, on the weekend, auctions still took place because we're able to you know, utilise and facilitate the, the, the technology aspect with regards to auctions. We're seeing it a lot in the property management space as well, completing things like FaceTime Live inspection so that they can showcase a property without the tenant needing to physically be there. We saw a moment ago that Shepparton Regional Area had gone up 40-plus uh, percent, and I would love a prediction for the next growth rate that our listeners would uh, get from you. But I know that's not your forte, making predictions of that sort, or giving us a, a street. Rather than a suburb, give us a street we should be buying in. Um, I wanted to ask, um, Liam, what are the vacancy rates like at the moment? Because there have been issues with international students and what vacancy rates specifically in the city, Melbourne CDB, what are, what are they like? 
Yeah, vacancy rates are certainly um, far greater than I've ever seen in, in my life as a property manager. I think our, our numbers are sitting at about 7.1% for the CBD. Um, so there's a lot of pain in that particular space. It's important that both property managers and, and investors understand that they've got to look at what's, a, what's taking place across all the different areas. So just because it's really hard to secure a tenant because of the closed borders, because of the no international students, and because of, you know, there is a lack of disposable income. So previously, if you were living alone, you might choose to rent a two bedroom property and have the second bedroom for friends or as a home office. Now people have downscaled and, and gone into that one bedroom. So it's super important for investors and, and property managers to make sure that they're marketing the property, they need to be on the ball with making changes and, and investors in that particular space are absolutely going to take a a reduction in the income that they're going to earn in this financial year and potentially next, um, but it's not it's not a long term issue. It's it's just this short term pain that we're going to experience for a little bit. I know that uh, Roy wanted a particular street, Lair, but um, perhaps generally <laughs> our, our your, your overview or your you know outlook, I suppose, for 2021, knowing that there's potentially lockdowns, there's potentially a vaccine, we, there there is going to be uncertainty. Do you have a general outlook for 2021? Look, I think we, we've really shown that the, the Victorian property market is really sound. And I know I probably sound like a broken record when I say that the resilience out there has been amazing. Um, so we know that it is a sound investment. You need to look at the, the different types of infrastructure that might be going into a regional city if that's where you're planning to invest. You've got to look at schools. You've got to look at all the traditional aspects that we consider. Um, but honestly, we, we are not seeing anything that is of any great concern. We know that the, the rental market is, is doing it tough at the moment. And we know there's legislation changes due to happen at the end of March. Um, but it, it's just considering all these moving factors, I, I, I think it's, it's remaining you know, relatively sound. Leah, it's been great to catch up with you today. Really appreciate your time. Thanks so much for joining us on RJ Sanderson TV. Uh, my pleasure. Leah Kelden, the president of the Real Estate Institute of Victoria. Roy, some positive messages coming out of there. It's nice to talk about some positive and optimistic stories uh, in amongst the, the doom and gloom. Do you have a message for those that are in lockdown at the moment? Um, yes, well, yes, well done to Leah, um, president of the REIV. They represent about 2,000 real estate agents around Victoria and she and her team do a great job. And my message for those in lockdown in Victoria, um, Hugh Hefner made a lot of money being at home in his pyjamas all day. So if you're in lockdown and you want to stay in your pyjamas, it worked for Hugh Hefner, so feel free to do so. Jeez, I, I think we have to leave it at, at that for today. Roy, thank you so much for joining us uh, on RJ Sanderson TV. Uh, looking forward to the next one already. Speak to you soon, Dave. Thank you. Thanks to everyone at home for watching. Uh, we appreciate your time on RJ Sanderson TV and we'll be back next month.